Hey, this is Chris with Collision Hub, and welcome to part two of post repair inspections. Now, in the first one, we talked about what is a post repair inspection, what are the typical types of post repair inspections, and we set up the scenario that we're going to dive a little bit deeper into today. We had a non customer complaint post repair inspection, so it is important to keep in mind that this was a customer that was pretty happy with this repair, didn't think there was going to be a problem at all. A 2013 Volkswagen Golf. Um, and we brought it in through the process and without giving Larry any information to keep it as uh, unbiased as possible, we did the visual inspection of just a walk around of the vehicle. And from there, enough red flags were noticed that we knew we were going to need to take a little bit of a deeper dive into this one. So I'm going to tell you right here, if you haven't watched the first episode, well, it's probably a good time to go back and watch that one so you can get up to speed on this one. Now, Larry, let's do a little recap. In that first uh, initial visual inspection, you found a few things wrong. What were some of those indicators again? Uh, I found visually some of the body lines weren't matching up with the left rear door and the left quarter panel, uh, the left tail light to the left hatch uh, backup lamp, and some sticking of the doors physically opening the uh, hatch and the left rear door seemed to not open as smoothly as the other doors in the vehicle. And from there now you knew it was time to take a deeper dive, move this a little bit maybe more into a teardown process. But before we get the thing in the shop and we start hammering on it or taking things apart, you do have a process that you go through. Can you talk a little bit about your research process? Well, my research process first is now once I do the visual and I get over that like we talked about in part one, and I did some of the film thickness measurements, which uh, I will probably repeat again. Uh, on there because I just did a quick check with the, with the vehicle. I'll now find out from the owner of the vehicle, or the client attorney, what was actually done to the car. I don't have to see the estimate. I don't need to know the name of the shop. I just need to know what was actually done. Now I go and I do my research of what the repair process is. So in this case, because I'm Volkswagen certified, I have access to Irwin for Volkswagen, which is their repair portal, information portal. Uh, you could get a a lot of the same information for all that or also. Uh, but I went into Irwin, printed out some of the repair procedures for Irwin, some of the checks on the car from Irwin, some of the resets that are required, like after an accident from Volkswagen, so that I have my paperwork prepared so I know what to look for while I'm at the car. Because, yeah, I work on cars, but I sometimes forget all the exact procedures, so I want to have it in front of me. All right, so it's important to know before you go out to that car and start even thinking about tearing it apart or getting into there to judge the repair that you've done all of your homework up front. And there's a couple of things that you're going to want to cover in that process. One, like Larry said, we're going to want to get all the repair information available from the OEM so that we can get out there and really judge the replacement procedures that were done. We're going to want to get a copy of the estimate and all of the supplements. So we want to be looking at the final estimate that was the paid delivered estimate for the car so that we can kind of see a repair track in the technician's mind or the estimator's mind of how that car went through the shop. The second thing that I really like to get a hold of is the pre-accident photos. So I want to know what the car looked like before we started touching it, before we started doing any work on it. And then the last thing that we always do before we dive too deep into a post repair inspection is what well, we do that owner interview where we have a chance to kind of talk the owner through it. And you had a chance to do all these on this car before we had to do the shop. Well, he had no, uh, no real complaints except after we pointed out a couple of things being a layman, then he noticed a couple of things that, yeah, you know what, yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, the door stuck a little bit. Yeah, the back door opened funny, but that was really it for him. I asked about drivability issues. I drove the vehicle to see if there was any drivability issues. I saw the pre-repair photos. It appeared that the vehicle, something backed into it or ran into it, more with applied impact force perpendicular to the vehicle center line. It pushed in the quarter panel, the rear door, the wheelhouse had to be involved, and the taillight was broken, so that's... Uh, the tail light pockets involved and that was really about it and the bumper cover had some damage to it also so but I didn't see anything on the wheel in the pictures so I was assuming and once again it's never good to assume but I was assuming I'm probably not going to find anything with the suspension but I still need to do some checks for it. Yeah. And between the time that the vehicle was actually returned to the customer until the time we got a hold of it approximately what 10, 15,000 additional miles have been put on the car, so? I think about 12 and change it was, so it, it was relatively the right area of, of mileage for the amount of time that this gentleman had this vehicle back uh, from the shop, so I didn't see anything else wrong with it. Uh, uh, it keeps it clean, it keeps it nice, so that was really uh, a, a definite factor in looking at the vehicle and saying, no, it doesn't look like it's been re-repaired anytime soon, but you can see it's a difference from the rest of the vehicle, mm -hmm. but nothing fresh. Now that we've gathered all of our information from the OEM, we've gotten our pictures, our estimate, we've done that interview with the customer, we'll be ready to take it into the additional stages, diving a little bit deeper into teardown. And that's when we're going to get it in the shop, 
get it up on the car liner rack and really start taking a look at it. And Larry, we got this one in the shop, put it on the rack, got it all set up for you. And you started that kind of visual process again with the mill gauge. Tell me a little bit about what you were doing in that process, mapping all that out. The reason I want a frame machine or some sort of a uh, uh, measuring system available to me. If I find enough stuff visually and through my uh, uh, inspection of the vehicle and disassembly, I might have to measure the car and I like that stuff right then and there and that's uh, demonstrative in a, in a court case to have that. So my first step was we put it up on top of the machine. I did my walk around again. Now I have it on something that, that's flat and level, the frame machine. And now I go and do my checks and I found some of the same stuff. And now I'm going to pull out my film thickness gauge. And I started measuring at the front of the car. And there's a certain process we go through of measuring a certain amount of points on a fender or a panel to get an average film thickness to judge to the OEM film thickness. Now I take an ink pen, erasable ink pen, and I write on the vehicle at these spots. So it not only works as a demonstrative visual tool, I don't have to sit there and write down all these numbers. I can just look at my pictures later on and do my calculations of how much film thickness is there and what's acceptable and what's not. So I start at the front end of the car and work my way all the way to the back of the vehicle doing my measurements. When I find an area uh, that has excessive amount of mill thickness, what I will then do is I'll go ahead and, and start measuring a lot closer of an area to really find out how much variances I have in that area. And you have to remember, three millimeters of material thickness is 119 mils. 119 mils on a car, or even uh, uh, if that's body filler plus paint material in there, even 127 is not unacceptable. People see a number and they, they have a heart attack. Uh, factory paint, you're gonna see anywhere from 4.1, 4.2, to like 5.5 on most of the European cars, most of the American cars, you're gonna see something closer to about 5.5 five, 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 uh, to 6.3 is usually uh, factory paint for those. So that's my first indication doing a, a forensic test on the vehicles, looking at the film thickness to find out where I'm gonna look behind the panels mm -hmm. in those areas. Now the other thing that that did for you is it let you know exactly what the shop had painted and not painted. So even particularly on the estimate, if we had replaced quarter, replaced door, blend front door, we even found out it looked like the paint went a little further down the car into the front fender. Um, and we had some blend aperture issues that we noticed when you were doing the mill. Can you explain that a little bit? All your paint companies are going to tell you the same thing, you have to clear to a panel's edge. Uh, for many years, we know back, <laughs> back uh, 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 when we started coming out with the upper outer roof rail, guys would leave open blends on the sail panel, that always became a nightmare. Now the big thing is, is just to clear all the way to the panel edge here. Well, Volkswagen in this particular case has a laser welded roof to the upper outer, uh, upper outer roof rail, the unicide panel, and there's no brake line. So in their procedures, you have to clear the roof in the other quarter panel. Now there's some shops that would take off all four doors and clear the whole entire unicide, which would cover the paint manufacturer's warranty and even Volkswagen's agreement with the certified repair shop. So you have to go up and over is what it's called. Um, this would be like up and across. In this case, the shop just went up and across. They made a, a hard line up here. Some of the paint's delaminating already after only like two, three months. There was a, a lot of rough edges in this back area here where they just left an open blend. Some rough areas in this front area down by the hinge where they also stopped painting. They just abruptly stopped and just whatever happened, happened. And in this particular case, the door probably should have come off. Front door should have come off and cleared out the whole side. Uh, they had to paint the roof for paint warranty and the other quarter panel, which I know can get expensive, but we don't design the cars, we don't insure them, we just fix them. And we follow what the manufacturer says. So there was some issues with that right off the bat that I found. Uh, some rough edges in here, obviously the hard line on here. A big difference in variance of film thickness. Where it got thinner, it actually got rougher in the paint. And then it got thicker down over here because obviously they painted the front fender. Maybe it was a color mismatch issue or whatever. But if I remember correctly, when I reviewed the estimate, it wasn't on the estimate, mm -hmm. the front right. fender. Yet the front fender was the same film thickness as the front door. And about two and a half, three mils on average difference on the uh, right side components. Uh, the front fender and the front door, which were more in the factory line of film thickness. So obviously the side of the car was painted, and I found that the moldings, which are not reusable, not serviceable on these, uh, because of the way they bend, they're softer metal uh, with a rubber coating on the outside, so they were lifted up, and there's numerous bends on the, on the belt moldings, which even in the uh, Volkswagen procedures tell you just change them. So uh, that became another indication. But I did notice some re uh, 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 paint 
overspray and paint edge lines on the reveal molding for the windshield which told me they left that molding in and didn't pop it off. And as you saw, that popped off one, two, three for me. So why couldn't you take it off in the shop? <laughs> right. From a technician's perspective, whether you're the shop that's done the repair and you're doing your own post repair inspection or you're a shop maybe inspecting somebody else, with that tech background, we generally want to jump right into teardown. We want to get in there and we want to see what's going on. But what this process did for us is it gave us a really great visual indication of exactly what was done with the car. We knew exactly where the sectioning points were for the quarter panel that was replaced based on the, the readings that Larry had. We knew what had been painted, what had not been painted, and what had maybe been painted a little stripey is the way I like to say it. As a, as a painter, I, sh I should have a really good follow through with my overlap. I should have a good process with my clear. And we kind of figured out, you know, I kind of got an idea what the painter was doing there that day. But that caused you when we got all that and we had it all mapped out. And I think uh, people were a little surprised to see how many numbers we had all over that car <laughs> by the yes. time we were done. Um, it was time to go a little deeper and do a little teardown. Now, do you have a process or a method for that that you like to start at when you start tearing down a vehicle for a post repair inspection? I popped up the rear seat. I popped up the door sill plate. I popped up the interior uh, rocker panel molding, which they have a big long one that runs the whole length. I popped off the bottom portion of the inner quarter panel trim panel, popped off the rear roof cross member reinforcement uh, trim piece, and of course the sail panel trim piece just to get access to the quarter. Now I can see the inside of the quarter panel. That's what I was really going for because I want to see the wheelhouse. I wanted to see the back side of the uh, taillight pocket with the taillight still in. I wanted to see where the sectioning procedure might be because sometimes the inner panels you can see behind there without using a bore scope and I wanted to see where the rocker sectioning was. Uh, based on my film thicknesses I found that they were located in, the, in, in what would be the proper spots according to the repair information so they obviously looked at something or right. guessed right. right. <laughs> it's either right. one of the two and then I found some other stuff when I started taking that apart and I found stuff that was would be disturbing to me as a, a, as a tech or what I started as as a welder and just some really bad stuff. Right. That's where it got really bad. Yeah, that's where this inspection started to take a turn. I just want to follow up a little bit. When Larry says we're looking at taking the easiest way possible to get in there, there's a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. There are a lot of interior trim panels these days that the OEMs have marked as non-reusable, specifically panels that are involved with covering of airbags. So in these cases, when those panels are removed either for access for repair or access for reinspection, if it is deemed a non-reusable interior trim piece by the OEM, well, in addition to your reinspection, you're going to be buying some panels to put back on that car. And this was something that we wanted to make sure that we weren't incurring too much cost to the customer by us just doing this repair. You'll see that a lot with eight pillar trims because <clears throat> they have a, a, a holder on there. When you do take the screw out, you can ruin the, uh, the strap that prevents this eight pillar trim piece from flying through the car like a tomahawk and hit somebody. Uh, the, the big thing that I look at is let's take apart the easy stuff. Body shops take stuff apart, you have a, a exfoliation of evidence it's called, and you don't give the other party a chance to look at it. So when I have to be careful on how I take things apart, how I look at things to be taken apart, and especially if I do, I mean just taking a wheel off a car is considered destructive testing. Probably not a big deal to a lot of people, but that also falls in the same category as ripping welds apart, which later on I got permission from the owner to do. But that's a big thing, and there's a very specific way of videotaping it. So that's why there's a big difference between shops doing this and a forensic investigation. All right, and in certain cases, a shop is going to remove those panels to get access. You just want to verify that what you're removing is something you're not going to have to buy in a pictures. Right. Pictures. You got. You can't, just can't go with your word. Take pictures of everything. Yeah. Exactly. You know. So we got these. Uh, we got this torn down. We got access in to look at the back of the quarter panel to where some of the sectioning was done. We got access to the wheelhouse. And Larry, that's where things took a little bit of a turn for us. Let's talk a little bit about what we found. We found resistance welds. Um, on the outside portion, this outside flange here, somebody had taken what appears to be, and once again, this wasn't required to be tested at this point, but what appears to be or give indications to suggest it's some sort of windshield primer urethane type primer, black primer. Uh, on the inside, backside area of the flanges, they were still bare metal, they were sanded down. There was no real big halos around the weld. The indentations of where the spot welds were, much like these, is mm -hmm. nice round deep circles, was small and not that deep. So I'm looking at and saying, I don't like the way these resistance welds look. It's almost like the tips were bad. They were bad tips. Then I looked at the inside of the sail panel and there was actually a big nice little oval piece that actually they show you in the Volkswagen procedure there's bonding material that has to go there. One there was no bonding material to glue the inner panel to the back side of the outer panel but also the weld went straight through there 
and it was mag welds. It was copper wire welding when it's supposed to be silicone bronze. And there was a bunch of wire sticking through, a lot of burnt edges. My problem with this one area here is that you had the panel off, you could have sanded the back side, because what techs don't do is they don't sand both sides of the panel that they're working on. Because in this case, if I'm welding these two panels together, I'm going to sand in here and in here and put, usually it's going to be some sort of weld through primer uh, by the manufacturer that they recommend, or even sometimes epoxy primer might be required if it has a high enough temperature uh, resistance to it. Uh, or you're going to be putting bonding adhesive in here and do squeeze type resistance spot welding. On the outside, you can either sand the whole flange or just sand each spot that you're going to do the resistance welding at. And after you're done, you would actually refinish that. Well, you need both sides because of the fact that the, the electrodes have to make contact. When people do mag plug welds, they'll drill a hole on this one. You sand in between, you put your primers, and on the back side, they leave it alone. What happens is you're burning the paint. One, you're causing more fumes for you to breathe in because it's burnt paint. You shouldn't be, if you can see air, you shouldn't breathe it. Number two, it takes you longer to clean it up because now you got burnt caked in paint on there. And you have that white, fluffy type of uh, uh, soot that's left over that also you, you need to clean up. Well, on here, it's pretty easy. It makes more work, but it's pretty easy to reach it. In some of those recessed areas and flanges, you can't get in there with a tool. Yet the quarter panel was off and I was able to reach everything. Now I can't because now it's welded together. So instead of just being able to uh, try and shove a stick with a, sc a scotch bite pad on there, or even just flooding the area with epoxy primer and then anti-corrosion compound afterwards, they couldn't do anything in there. And they didn't do anything. And that's what I found, a lot of that white soot stuff and a lot of burnt areas that no one made any attempt to spray anything in there. Because in some cases, if you attempt it and it sucks, guess what? You're not held as responsible as somebody just said, ah, I'm not doing nothing. So they didn't even try to do anything in those areas. So we had the sail panel that had that and the entire flange for the floor pan, extension panel to the quarter panel, to the rear body panel and the taillight pocket to the quarter were all burnt very badly. And not even the proper type of welding from the backside. There were issues with wire sticking through. The guy obviously got it too hot. The tech, in my opinion, doesn't know how to weld properly, which is a, a major problem in this industry. All right, Larry, so let's just recap that quarter real quick. So we, as you looked at it, we found that the technician actually selected the right sectioning locations. But then other than that, that's really where we lost the OEM procedures on that panel, right? He did a lot of um, poor mag welding processes. Uh, he missed putting uh, bonding adhesive on the door opening flange area uh, for the quarter panel, like the dog leg area, that entire rear opening uh, area there requires it with squeeze type resistant spot welding. Uh, didn't use silicone bronze the way he was supposed to and his mag welding techniques were uh, atrocious and uh, didn't use good cleaning processes and then didn't try to even attempt to put in any type of corrosion resistant primers or even anti-corrosion compounds, something. I mean, that, not that it's proper, but he didn't even try and throw undercoating in there. <laughs> you know, something, give me something to try and prevent something. He right. just didn't care, which would have came back in about eight months from now and probably really, you know, caused an issue. As the customer got down the road, maybe a couple years from now or even a year from now, that we were going to have a lot of corrosion problems with that vehicle. Uh, but now that we've got past the quarter panel, you were actually in and taking a look at that wheelhouse. Um, Larry, what did we find on the wheelhouse? Well, from the back side of the wheelhouse inside the quarter panel, what I found was a lot of hammer marks on the back side of the panel. Four hours of repair on there, and this seems to be a lot of hammer marks. Maybe this thing should have been changed. If this is the area I can see, what else can I see that's on here? So I said, all right, let's lift up the uh, Carolina frame machine. Let's bring it up in the air a little bit. And if I have to jack up and take off a wheel, I will. But let's see what we can see first when I get it up. And when I got it up in the air, I got it up at eye level, I noticed that the two clips for the fiber uh, splash shield that's in there, they usually use it for sound denting purposes, I was able to pull it forward. So I got my flashlight, and I'm looking underneath there, and I was like horrified at what I saw. Not the hammer marks, but uh, the butchering that went on. I'd love to know why there's like six, I think, drill holes outside of leaking water out of there. I can't see any other reason for drilling these holes. It's not attached to anything, but they're all in a neat little row. They're all, you know, one-eighth drill bits, and I'm wondering why did someone drill these holes here? It was just horrific what I saw on the inside. 
Yeah, I think that's going to be our million dollar question because it wasn't even, you know, like a drill to install a clamp to make a rough pull with because we did have some rough pulls that were listed on this and estimate. And I still don't understand that, what yeah. a rough pull is. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the car's structurally damaged, you're changing parts, you're welding them on, the car should be on top of a, a flat machine surface such as the frame machine. Worst case scenario, just put it up in the, the, the jack mounts or, the, or, or on the uh, pinch welds if the manufacturer sets it up that way. And you're not pulling anything, you just, you, in this case you didn't have to pull anything. Everything that they had time to pull on should have just been changed. Should have been really just a chop and change type process, which is what most cars have nowadays. It's more time in setup than there is in actual pulling. Right, I think we would have all been happy to have seen some sort of three-dimensional measurement taken. The car was hit, the car was brought in for repair, let's measure it. Um, and, and we did not have that on the testament. There was no 3D measuring done of the vehicle, so uh, hence why we had it in, <laughs> having it looked at. So after we had discovered that we had um, issues with the wheelhouse, we had an improper placement of the quarter panel, you did get permission to do a little destructive testing on the welds. And before we leave that topic, um, I kind of want you to explain that a little bit about what you did uh, with those spot welds and kind of what we saw with that. Each manufacturer will have, it's sometimes buried in their information, they'll have a process for uh, testing spot welds so that you can do destructive testing on your own. Uh, Honda, for example, has it where in between the spot welds on the flanges, you would take a wedge and you try and put the wedge in there. If they pop, <laughs> no good. If they don't pop, don't break them. That means they're holding and you have to get the wedge in there a certain distance. Other companies such as uh, Ford will have with weld bonding procedures, they'll have a, a lap shear test where you pull it back against itself. You have two welds, the first weld and then the second weld, you want to rip those apart. And it's got to pull five times the metal thickness of what's there. Now five millimeters, five times the metal thickness. And there's a couple of different things here, but I'm not going to get into a resistance welding class. But I was anticipating getting a nice you know, nugget pulled out of, the, out of that area is what I normally expect to happen or anticipate. In this particular case, I took a, um, a, a small body hammer, not even a big heavy hammer, because I said I like to do this when we film or take pictures with a small hammer to show that I, I wasn't using some big heavy duty thing. And I took a, a regular uh, Steck weld buster and I tapped it in between the, the two spot welds and then I lightly tapped it going across and literally the weld broke out and broke out about a two millimeter oval shape type uh, uh, tear out, which is unacceptable in this case. We know we had some issues before, but at that point, the reinspection really hit, a, hit the moment where I don't think we needed to go any deeper. We knew that we had some issues that had to be resolved. And at that point, we uh, put the car on the back lot and put that customer in a rental car because that was not leaving the shop with someone in the back seat. The car's deemed unsafe to drive. And the reason is, uh, one, the spot welds weren't holding in properly. Number two, the, the amount of damage to the, uh, I guess the best way to say it is deformities that are on there, but the crumpling of the panel and how crumpled it looked, the wheelhouse, uh, were indications that this wheelhouse is going to fail very rapidly in a subsequent collision event. So in this case, whoever was sitting in the, in the, in the passenger area could be subject to injuries just as much as the operator of the vehicle for a rear collision event or a, an event that would apply impact force to that rear quarter panel, body panel area. I don't even take off the rear bumper cover and we didn't put it up in the air, we didn't take all the splash shields off. We found enough evidence to say this car is dangerous to drive and it was recommended, you know, my professional opinion was don't drive the car, get yourself in a rental, let's make some phone calls to whoever we need to make phone calls to. All right, Larry, we got the customer out of the car, we got him in a rental, and there's a long way to go still left on this one, and, and it's going to take probably a, a while before we get a resolution. But let's talk about what some of the consequences and potential resolutions are when a situation like this arises for a repairer or even an insurer. It's a first-party claim. Third-party hit him at, at fault. He did the smart thing. He went through his own insurance, went to the insurance company's uh, uh, direct repair shop. So. This should be rectified fairly quickly. The bigger issues are something like a third party claim with a, uh, um, a body shop that's not an insurance company program. It can become a major issue. You're talking three, four years down the road. I think this particular vehicle will probably be solved within a week or two is generally what I see happen, um, which is a good thing in that way, in that respect. A third party, even through the insurance company's direct repair program, usually can get rectified pretty quickly without a litigation or a lawsuit. It's the First party or third party, the guy just goes to any body shop he wants, especially if it's a smaller shop, not multiple location, it becomes a major issue. The situation that comes in is that if people just took pride in their work 
and took the time, instead of worrying about cycle time and numbers and just worried about fixing the car the right way and checking in each department, you probably would never get into this situation here. No insurance company has ever paid a body shop to do bed welds. They paid them to put the quarter on. Right. And the guy couldn't put the quarter on properly. Now, it could be lack of training, lack of pride, uh, lack of management to watch over the tech to make sure he's right. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of different things that can happen. The consequences by not checking and doing balance, checks and balances is, one, if you're on a DRP and it was fixed through a DRP, someone's going to be mad at you from the you know, direct repair program from the insurance company. You're going to get a manager down there. This is not some adjuster that's coming down. You're getting a manager, maybe even a regional guy, that's going to come down and it's going to be a problem. How many times can this happen before maybe you lose that relationship that you have with that insurance company? Number two, it gives a customer a bad, bad taste in their mouth. Number three, there's people out there that will post it all over Facebook and name names and do stuff like that, and that gives you bad publicity. Because always remember, you know, you, Somebody has a good experience where they tell like 10 people. Someone has a bad experience, they tell 60. And that becomes now a problem where now, you know, it's out there and people know about it. The financial costs. You're either re-repairing the car at for free. You're uh, um, going to be really under a heavy scrutiny this time, probably that third-party independent, if the customer went ahead and allowed the re-repair to happen um, at the same shop, is going to get checked again. Um, they might choose to use a different shop to re-repair the car. Now that to become somebody else's issue. And I've seen shops that have had stuff like that and said, well, we'll put a new quarter on. No, you need a wheelhouse. No, we think we can fix it. Okay, now you just, you, you own that wheelhouse now. It's not their fault anymore. Um, that's why a lot of times it becomes so expensive to do a re-repair because you have to rip everything apart. Sometimes it's just better to total the car and get it out. Because if you get a car apart, like this, <laughs> um, it's not sellable. At least right now, this gentleman's car is sellable the way it is. We took some interior trim parts out, and they could still sell this car to somebody else if they wanted to in the auction, red light it and stuff like that. So the consequences are, can be very, very expensive financially, not just on the car, but on your reputation. And that's what people don't realize. There's only so many times you can get banged out on, on you know, a bad repair before somebody starts saying, hey, what's going on here. And insurance companies look at this stuff. I know they follow my Facebook stuff. I know they follow other people. They see this. They know what's going on. Right. And in the case of what just happened in North Carolina, that $20,000 car with a bad repair just cost that particular repair almost $500,000 in, in fees and judgments and whatever over just what was a simple a simple repair, really. In uh, the, the, the frame should have been replaced in that yeah. car, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's funny because Part of their program, their shop, part of their shop system, they're actually on the program. So they just didn't repair it in that shop. Yeah. It's, yeah. You had the guy, to, you know, take him out of one shop and bring him over there. I mean, yeah. you know, get, get advice. And, and, a, and a great case probably in that one where, um, you know, we see this a lot of times when we're doing post repair inspections that it, it comes down to maybe a car the shop was trying to save. Uh, they didn't want it to total um, and those, it's just generally never a bad, a good idea. If you're starting to think that you're trying to save a car, you keep it from totaling, just let it go. Well, that you becomes know? a problem with a lot of people. Uh, I see a lot of, a lot of owners of shops who aren't educated in the collision repair field w feel that totaling out a car is like losing a family member. And that's a, just an asinine way of thinking about stuff because now you're just looking at numbers. And in some cases, it's actually better to total the car route. Um, once again, as long as it's not a structural thing, um, you know, maybe you want to repair it and you save some money for the customer. I understand more rural areas, people keep their cars 10 years. I'm in New York City, everyone drives something they're not supposed to be driving and they drive them for three years because they're leases, so they don't care. I think a, another thing that shops need to look at is pride in their work and just keeping checks and balances. Everyone just worries so much about cycle time and numbers. Watch the car through the repair process. You can eliminate a lot of this stuff if before the car was reassembled, somebody looked on the inside back of the panels and sprayed some stuff on there. If somebody made sure the bumper was aligned properly, somebody put a little bit of grease in the door, it's probably all this guy's door needed was some grease and a little bit of alignment. A lot of this stuff unfortunately would have been corrected before it got back, given back to the customer. The wheelhouse is nothing you could do with, but the rest of it could have been corrected beforehand. And just, I mean, tip maintenance on the uh, squeeze cypress is a spot welder. If that shop let me in, I guarantee you the only problem with that machine, because you, you verified what machine it was, it's mm -hmm. a good machine, it's just the, the tips were bad. That's it, the, the, yeah. the tech didn't understand I got to sharpen the tips, I got to clean the tips, I got to make sure they're good. So with the lesson we've learned here is that besides just avoiding a post repair inspection in general that's going to come back to a third party and maybe end up with one of those six-figure lawsuits like we, we've talked about, there are other things you can do in the facility. 
quality control checks through the process, investments in training in either the OEM, your vendors, or ICAR. You can do more in-house training, welding. You can also take care of your maintenance of your equipment and ensure that you're not testing it on the day that the vehicle's in your shop. Larry, what's your closing thoughts on this topic? If you have a question, give a call to a post repair inspector that you know that's out there. Um, if it gets way above the range, I work with a, I've worked with a few of the post repair inspectors in the country that realize it's going to become a, 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 a QRE, a quality of repair examination, where now you've got a forensic examination going on. Um, call up, ask. If you can solve it with the insurance company, you probably don't need a, a professional. If it does become a problem, then you're probably going to need a professional. But always ask first. That's the problem that I see in this industry. People are afraid to ask questions. All right. And it's all important to be willing to learn. And to learn, you got to ask. So join us next time on Repair University when we tackle another topic in today's collision repair industry.